by this ridge, Is it and it was quite an important ridge for them because it offered great observation over the town of Arras, which was a communication center at the time, and also over it protected the town of Lens, which was an industrial town important for the German war economy. And finally, it also overlooked the trenches, so the Germans were able to see the, the formations, the Allied formations, the Allied positioning from from the from the ridge. Now, the French arrived in 1915. Tried, uh, they, they did launch an assault on the Notre Dame de Lorette Ridge. It was successful, a successful assault at a cost of 120,000 French soldiers, however. But um, for here, the ridge was more of a defensive holding. They, weren't, they didn't plan any large offensives. Now, in 1916, the British came in February of 1916, and they took over for the French who were off to Verdun. Now, when the British first arrived, they realized that they were in quite a precarious situation because the Germans have been constructing underground tunnels and subways below their feet even and have been even exploding trenches from below the British feet. So they called for five Royal Engineering Tunneling Companies to come in to counteract this effort. And within six months of tunneling, the, the tables had turned so much that it was now the Germans who were launching offensive on the British on the British undergrounds. And the Canadians arrived six months later from that February, so November of 1916, and they used these subways in preparation for the attack of Vimy Ridge on April 9th. Now no one really lived down in these subways. It was used mainly for transportation, for communication. However, the night before the attack on Vimy, uh, you had 20,000 Canadian soldiers sleeping in these subways, waiting for the morning. And uh, this this is one of the subways, La Grange, is one of the 13 subways that were, were dug. And uh, this is the second longest one with a distance of 1.2 kilometers. So originally, um, Originally, this subway would have extended all the way into the trees off into the distance there. However, today it only goes to a boat where those were. This is how the original tunnel would have looked like. Now, I, keep, uh, I call this a subway because originally there would have been a light rail going along here, which would have aided in the transportation of goods and the carrying of materials. And there would have been a wheelbarrow that went on this rail and would have been pushed by hand. Um, but as well, we have explained the lighting a bit already. And for the, uh, for the supports, these, everything that's been concreted would not have originally been there. It would have been a wooden support. And you can see the remnants of an old wooden support on the left side here of the, uh, of the wall. And the ceiling as well was added in because these tunnels were open to the public in 1922. And that's why all these changes had to be brought to the, to the tunnel. So originally it would have been a bit more rounded off as you can see but still the same height. The reason why there's so much stuff in here in this tunnel is because when, the, when they were reopening these subways to the public, when they were widening them, widening them they threw the, uh, the debris into the closed so off tunnels the, that weren't going to be the used. So this shows a bit about again, an original bedroom. tunnel that hasn't been touched. This room? There was, was a bedroom. And as I said earlier, the men really didn't sleep in these undergrounds except for the night before, but there were some exceptions, and this room would have been an exception. That's where the runners slept. Now, runners were messengers of the First World War, so they would carry messages from officer to officer, up in the front line, up in the trenches, sometimes even in no man's land. And it was quite a dangerous position. The bravest and the uh, fittest men were usually picked, and you always got sent off in pairs in case someone got injured or killed. Because all runners were equipped with an armband, so that when they were running in the trenches, their fellow soldiers knew that they had to get out of the way for this message. But at the same time, it meant that the Germans, the German snipers, could see who was carrying important messages and who was, uh, who was running around with, with the armband. So as you can imagine, it was like a target on their back. And uh, once you were picked to be a runner, your average lifespan was about five to six days. So it was quite a, quite a dangerous position. And uh, an interesting fact is also in the First World War, Adolf Hitler was a runner for the, for the German army. And he actually got wounded in, uh, in the Artois region, so just around here. And he got his second Iron Cross, I believe, in this region as well. So I guess that's one runner that made it past his five, six days. But, sort of unfortunately. Uh, yeah, kind of unfortunately. <laughs> This room would have been used by the runners as well as its communication room. So this is where you would have a, a typewriter, a telegraph, um, you'd have maybe messenger pigeons, and you also have these green glass isolators that you've probably seen throughout the tunnels. 
Now the purpose for these was to isolate the, your electrical current and your communication uh, cables off the chalk. Because communication line, I'm sorry, because chalk is quite uh, conductive and, abs and absorbs sound quite well. So the fear was that if the communication line was on the, on the chalk, there's a chance that the Germans could intercept these messages with their listening posts and so on. So uh, there's over 3,000 kilometers of communication lines that were put down into these subways. And especially during winter, when the, uh, when the chalk can get quite humid and quite damp, uh, this can sometimes interfere with, with the signaling. And that's why these are all isolated off, off the wall. Now, uh, we saw one bedroom here with, uh, with what would have originally been 12 beds. So it would have been stacked bunk bed style, and they were known as hot beds. Because as soon as one runner got off the bed, a new runner would come in and take his spot. So I guess the bed was all hot. But, um, we're not gonna... So uh, the room we saw in there was a private bedroom. And that would have been the room of the commander of the battalion. Because battalion, two battalions rotated using these headquarters as their general headquarters. There was the PPCLI, the Princess Patricia's Canadian Light Infantry, and the Black Watch of Montreal. And every five days they rotated using these headquarters as their battalion headquarters. And the night of the attack, leading up to the attack, it was the PPCLI who was using this room. And this was an operations room. So you'd have maps, you'd have discussions relating to the battalion, such as rations and equipment. Most of the main decisions would have probably been made kilometers away from the front line. But there's still kind of a nerve control for the battalion here. And that would have been the bedroom of Lieutenant Colonel Agar Adamson. And the only reason I mention that is because every day, Lieutenant Colonel Agar Adamson would wrote a letter to, to his wife. Um, so perhaps some of you have actually a published book. They even have it up at, uh, on display at the, in the visitor center if you want to see it. But it's, uh, yeah, he would write a letter every day to his wife, who was a nurse, uh, serving for the First World War as well. And she would write back as well. They had a, now, uh, read some letters. Some of them are pretty good at reply about the, some of them are quite the only one that you But others are quite loving on our tour to the exchange just because, you, again, the tunnels were widened off after the war. So all the original pieces were lost. And we've had school groups coming in and thinking they're smart and clever, writing their names on the walls. But um, they, uh, this one here is believed to be a real one because of its depth. And also because this is a carving that's found thousands and thousands of times in the unopened subways that were never open to the public. And it's a maple leaf. And what's interesting about that is because, as some of you may know, the maple leaf only came, became part of Canada's flag in 1965. During the First World War, Canada fought, fought under the red ensign, which was a red flag with the Union Jack and the, its provinces on it. And the fact that a Canadian soldier would carve a maple leaf uh, close to 50 years before his flag even got implemented shows something about, uh, about the pride they still felt. Because, uh, all of the, because Canada entered the war sorry, under the British Expeditionary Force. So each Canadian soldier wore the same uniform that a British soldier would wear. And the only way to distinguish between the two would be by the cap badges or by the arm badge. And for the Canadian regiments, it was a maple leaf. And here, uh, for the Battle of Vimy, was the first time in the war that all four Canadian divisions came together to fight as Canadian Corps under Canadian leadership. And it was the first time that that happened in the war. And so you had 100,000 men meeting each other for the first time, ready for the attack on Vimy. And the fact that uh, a Canadian soldier would carve the maple leaf just shows the pride he still felt for his country and showed the unity of, of the soldiers still, all fighting under the maple leaf. But uh, yeah, and we saw the flag here, and now uh, so we saw the, uh, the tube that showed how deep we are and where we are under the ground. Now we're going to start heading towards the other side of the tunnel, and I just want you to notice the shape that the tunnel will take eventually. It will come into a bit of an S shape at one point, and say that either it could be a miscalculation that they start digging from opposite sides and then meet up in the middle, or it's also believed, which is, seems to be more probable, that it was built for kind of the same reasons the trenches were built. So for security reasons, in case you uh, yeah. infiltrated the yeah. tunnel with a machine gun or somewhat. So uh, what you saw down there was, was an example of a fighting tunnel. And they're so-called fighting tunnels because they would extend towards the German front line.